Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Wednesday. This is Damon Lester, president of NAMAD. And uh, today we want to welcome you all for to our convention webinar. Um, today's topic, we're going to talk about the Paycheck Protection Program loan use and forgiveness update. And, and our good friend Richard Sox is going to provide us um, with an update on the final um, uh, resolutions that they just came out with. Um, and also, please note, if you have not um, applied for SBA loan, there's about $130 billion left in the uh, Congress ended um, the deadline for people to apply for the loan. Uh, with that said, please make welcome Richard Sox from Bass Sox Mercer. Thank you, Damon. Uh, good morning, everyone. Appreciate you joining us for uh, this webinar. Uh, I'm going to cover today just the updates uh, to the Paycheck Protection Program that uh, recently came out, uh, as Damon said. Uh, I want to start with a little disclaimer um, that my opinions uh, related to the PPP program and these, these latest updates are subject to further guidance and rules by the uh, SBA and the Department of Treasury. They seem to want to put rules out uh, and updates about every week or so, so uh, things are subject to change. Uh, fortunately, so far, we've been pretty accurate with our interpretations, uh, and any changes have been positive changes uh, by the Department of Treasury or SBA actually expanding uh, the program in terms of making it easier to obtain forgiveness uh, for your loan proceeds. So that's the good news. So the changes that we're going to talk about today result from three different items. The first is, of course, Congress's passing of the Flexibility Act uh, on June 5th. Uh, the next thing that occurred was the SBA issued revisions to the loan forgiveness application and that was issued on June 16th. <clears throat> and then finally, uh, the SBA revised uh, their inter interim rule uh, on loan forgiveness. And by the way, what that means is, is that they issued a rule when this all started, when the first PPP program came out. And then as they um, address different questions that the public has about the program or address uh, changes that Congress, Congress makes to the program, like in the Flexibility Act, they go in and they, in essence, add to uh, the rule, uh, the interim final rule. And so it stays as interim because it continues to change over time. And that, was, that latest change was done on June 22nd. All right, the first uh, area we're going to cover are changes to the loan terms itself. And the first change uh, that was certainly a, a good change is the maturity date uh, was increased uh, from uh, two years to five years. And that's if your loan is made after June 5th. So many of the folks on the call today uh, hopefully obtain their PPP loan earlier than June 5th. And in that case, the Flexibility Act allows you to go to your lender and seek an agreement to extend the maturity date to five years. And of course, this only applies to the amount of the loan that is not forgiven. And as we're going to talk about as we go through these slides, uh, they, it is looking like it's going to be easier and easier to have the vast majority of your loan proceeds forgiven. So hopefully, uh, the extent of the maturity date is not going to be as significant as it would have been otherwise. Next change to the loan terms is, if you'll remember, initially uh, the SBA interpreted the PPP uh, legislation to require that for um, use of the proceeds, and then of course forgiveness as well, you had to utilize 60% of your proceeds for eligible payroll costs, uh, and the other 40% excuse me, 75% for your eligible payroll costs and the other 25% for eligible non-payroll costs. That, those percentages were changed 
uh, and they now uh, are even more liberal in terms of uh, the ability to um, expand your forgiveness amount. They moved the eligible payroll costs percentage down to 60%, which of course increases your eligible non-payroll costs to 40%. Now, there was no change, we keep getting this question, there was no change <clears throat> to the definition of uh, how floor plan interest plays into uh, the non-payroll costs, unfortunately. There was no clarification uh, that uh, the floor plan interest would fall under uh, the one of the three categories of, of eligible non-payroll costs, which if you'll recall, include utility expenses, rent expense, and interest on mortgages, both personal um, uh, personal property uh, and, and commercial property. So some people want to make the argument that floor plan interest falls under that interest on mortgage. Uh, I personally think that's a tough argument. A more, uh, the, the term mortgage has a has a legal definition associated with an amortized loan. Uh, the floor plan interest is more along the lines of a revolving line of credit, which has a different legal definition. So I think it's going to be tough to include floor plan interest in your eligible non-payroll costs. However, again, because the program keeps expanding to make it easier for you to obtain forgiveness of of all of your loan proceeds, hopefully you you won't need to push that floor plan interest into your non-payroll costs as part of your forgiveness application to begin with. All right, for loans that were received after June 5th, the covered period, and, and I'm gonna to refer to the covered period as the forgiveness period, uh, during the webinar, that uh, for those loans, the forgiveness period increases from eight weeks to 24 weeks. Now, the good news for those of you that received your uh, loan disbursement prior to June 5th or on June 5th, you get to choose whether your forgiveness period is going to be either the original eight weeks or whether you want to take advantage of the, the new 24-week option. We're gonna talk uh, towards the end of the webinar uh, about uh, scenarios that might result in you wanting to uh, look at the shorter uh, period of time. So just uh, keep that in the back of, your, back of your head for the moment and we'll get there in just a few minutes. Okay. The, the new um, legislation and the changes to the application as well as the uh, change to the interim final rule by the SBA clarified that the forgiveness period, whether it's the eight weeks or the 24 weeks, still begins at your choice either on the date of the loan disbursement or your first payroll date following your receipt of the loan proceeds. And that's, if you, if you utilize that second option for when your forgiveness period starts, that is referred to in the legislation as the alternate covered period. We're gonna call that the alternate forgiveness period. And very importantly, there were no changes made to the SBA's interpretation of what expenses fall within either the forgiveness period or the alternate forgiveness period. And this is really a crucial item in terms of maximizing your forgiveness amount. And to use payroll as an example, uh, in, within the forgiveness period or the alternate forgiveness period, your payroll that you uh, pay and which is incurred during the period, the forgiveness period, uh, both fall within the forgiveness amount. And what I mean by that is that if you um, choose the alternate forgiveness period so that you your eight weeks or your 24 weeks does not start until that first payroll date after you receive your loan proceeds, that payroll 
that you, that first payroll you make was actually incurred or earned by the employees prior to the beginning of your forgiveness period. But nonetheless, the SBA interpreted the legislation to say that is included in the forgiveness amount. And then at the end of the forgiveness period, for any weeks or days that are not actually paid, but employees have earned wages, and you pay them after the end, end of the uh, forgiveness period, those are also included in the forgiveness, forgiveness amount. So this is an area where they absolutely maximize your opportunity to uh, have the largest forgiveness amount possible. And so that has not changed, uh, even with the expansion of the uh, forgiveness period to an optional 24 weeks. <clears throat> Okay, if you'll remember, now we're gonna look at some of the specific changes to the forgiveness rules. If you remember, under the qualifying payroll costs, an owner employee was limited uh, in, in, in terms of the amount that could be put towards forgiveness to the lesser of the uh, annualized salary and wages of $100,000 over the eight week test period or forgiveness period and that equals $15,385 or the owner employee's average salary and wages in 2019 over an eight week equivalent period, uh, the lesser of those two. So with the expansion of the forgiveness period or at least an optional expansion of forgiveness period to 24 weeks, we weren't sure how uh, owner employee wages and salary were be held for forgiveness. So that's been answered. And the way that's gonna work is it is the lesser of salary and wages of two and a half months equivalent of the $100,000 annual salary, which equals $20,833 or two and a half months of the owner employee's average salary and wages in 2019. Now, the reason that they didn't use the full 24 weeks and limited it to two and a half months is because if you remember when you applied for your loan, it was based upon two and a half months of salary and wages uh, for all employees and owner employees. And so what they did not want to have happen is you receive loan proceeds based on two and a half months of your total payroll, you eliminate employees, and then you turn around and can use that additional money now that's left over to pay owner salaries in excess of the two and a half months that the loan proceeds were based on to begin with. They believe that that would have been a windfall for the owner employees. And of course, their opinion is that's not what Congress intended for the use of this money. So they're limiting it to the two and a half months equivalent. Okay, we got a clarification uh, that was helpful as well uh, in the new uh, rule and, and, and as well as in the forgiveness application itself. And that is, we weren't sure when you, if you remember, there's uh, three tests that are gonna be done to look at whether your forgiveness amount is reduced. The first one's the payroll test. Second one is the full-time equivalent or headcount test. And the third one is the what's now 60-40 split between payroll and non-payroll. Now, in, in looking at the, the reductions under those tests, there were some exceptions that would allow you not to suffer a reduction in, in your forgiveness amount. And we weren't sure, and, and if, if you'll remember, they involved a rehiring or a restoring of the pay that was reduced uh, below 25% uh, to various employees. And if you restored the pay or restored the position by June 30th, and now the rule is December 31st, did you have to wait until that date to apply for your loan forgiveness? 
we weren't sure when you had to establish that you restored that pay and restored those positions to avoid a reduction in your forgiveness amount. Well, we've gotten the answer now, and the answer is that all you have to do is show at the time of your forgiveness application, whenever you, you make that application, that you have restored any pay that has been reduced more than 25% or uh, any full-time equivalents less than what you had prior to February 15th, then you're good to go. You don't have to wait till June 30th or under the new rule to December 31st. And, and there's nothing, and I may get this question, so I'll go ahead and answer it now. There's still nothing in the legislation or the rules that talks about when you restore somebody's pay or restore a position in order to avoid a reduction in your forgiveness amount, how long do you have to keep that pay at that level and how long do you have to keep that position employed at the dealership? Can you just do it for the week that you make your loan application? Uh, do you need to have that uh, restored for a period of time so that if you get audited and they come in, they can still see that you're still making that, uh, that, that level of pay or still have that uh, position restored. We don't know. We don't know. It's been it's silent. Uh, and all we know is at the time you make your forgiveness application, that's when you have to demonstrate that you've restored the pay and the positions that were reduced. Okay. Now, if you remember, um, as I said, on the payroll test, any reduction in employee salary and wages during the forgiveness period as compared to the first quarter of 2020 of more than 25% results in a reduction of your forgiveness amount. Now, what's been clarified here is what happens when we do the math on the eight or 24 weeks. So if there's been a salary reduction of more than 25% uh, that's deducted from your forgiveness amount, you are going to multiply and, and, and you restore that, excuse me, before you restore that, under the payroll test, you're going to multiply the amount of salary reduction above 25% by the number of weeks that you choose for your forgiveness period. So it's either going to be eight weeks or 24 weeks. So if you reduce an employee's pay by more than 25% and that dollar amount equals $100 per week, you're going to multiply that $100 by eight for an $800 reduction in your forgiveness amount if you choose the eight week forgiveness period if you choose the 24-week forgiveness period, that's going to be a reduction in your forgiveness amount of $2,400. So a significant difference. So it's important. This is the first area where we put a little star next to this to say this is an area where we need to do an analysis as to whether it makes more sense to stay with the eight-week period or go to the 24-week forgiveness period. And this is just a matter of doing the math to determine whether you maximize your forgiveness amount over the eight-week period with potentially less of a reduction, or do you maximize it over a 24-week period? Okay, let me refresh everybody's memory on the existing exemptions to a reduction under the FTE or headcount test. Now, that test, if you remember, looks at your full-time equivalents as of February 15th, and if there has been a reduction, then, uh, sorry, uh, as compared to two different comparison periods, which are not important for purposes of this webinar, but there are two earlier periods you get to choose from. If you've had a reduction in your FTEs, then uh, you, you suffer a reduction in your forgiveness dollar amount, unless 
one of these exemptions apply. And the current exemptions are that if you attempt uh, to rehire that employee and refill that position at the same wages for the same position and the employee refuses, then you don't get penalized for the loss of that position in your FTE test. Same thing goes for an employee that's terminated for cause, an employee that voluntarily resigns, an employee that requests and receives a reduction in their hours, which causes a reduction in the full-time equivalent calculation, and a reduction in your FTE count that occurs between February 15th and April 26th, but is restored by June 30th, or now we know is restored by the date that you make your forgiveness application. So those are the existing exemptions that take you out from under a penalty on your forgiveness amount under the FTE test. Now, two more exemptions have been added to that list. And the first one is the dealership's inability to hire everyone we're trying to get rich back so um i know you probably can't hear his sound anymore uh rich can you check your settings for your sound Hey everyone, please stand by. Uh, he's dialing back in.
There's a question. What if the employee changes positions to keep employment and that position pays less? How does that play out for the forgiveness? David, I'm having trouble hearing you. Um, can you check your chat? I can see you chat. Uh, question on the. Uh, Yeah, I did. It's, on our, on our, uh, it's, in your, it's in your screen now. Okay. Let me see here. Okay. Question is, what if the employee changes position to keep employment and that position pays less? How does that play out for forgiveness? Okay. Um, so, I'm going to do... I understand the question. There's two different analyses that occur there. One is if you look at the employees that you have employed during the forgiveness period, and if any of those employees have a reduction in their pay, even if it's a change of position of more than 25% as compared to their average pay during the first quarter of 2020, then there's a potential reduction in forgiveness. And then separately from that, if you have a reduction in position by hour, the full-time equivalent position, which in your example, if somebody just switches positions, I don't think that can impact your FTE test, but it could impact, again, your payroll test if it's a reduction in pay of more than 25%. Okay? Let me, uh, I'm going to run through the last two exemptions. Uh, to the FTE test, because we need a little more clarification on it. So, on the inability to hire a similarly qualified employee for that same position, we believe that the business is going to have to provide the course documentation to support that. And, and, the, and, what we, and there's no guidance on this yet, but what we envision is that you're going to want to include any advertising you did to uh, replace that position, any applications that were received, uh, any notes uh, taken from an interview of an applicant, and then ultimately rejection letters that you sent to those applicants because they were not qualified for the position. Okay. Now, the second exemption, which is really broad and, and takes away any reduction that you could suffer in the forgiveness amount under the FTE test. These other exemptions relate to specific positions. This exemption covers all your reductions in FTE if you, if you can support. And so let's, let's look at what it's going to take to support this exemption. Again, the exemption being when you're not able to operate at the same level of business activity during the forgiveness period 
as you did prior to February 15th. Now, that inability to be at the same level of business activity has to result from the uh, guidelines issued by federal, state, or local authorities related to handling COVID-19. I don't think anybody's going to have difficulty with that last piece of it. Unless your reduction in business activity is the result of something completely unrelated to the coronavirus and the pandemic, and that's going to be a very rare situation. So what is meant by business activity? Uh, I've conferred with some of the accountants in the industry that, that uh, we work with, and I think we all agree that business activity is looked at on the revenue side of the of the balance sheet, that it's going to look at whether you've had a reduction in vehicle-related and service-related sales revenue. It's not going to be a P&L analysis because the P&L analysis can shift with reductions in expenses. And this focuses on business activity, which, again, we all interpret to mean whether customers are coming in and buying at the same level both sales and service related uh, purchases as they were prior to February 15, 2020. So if your sales revenues decline on the whole over the course of the forgiveness period as compared to prior to February 15, then we believe this exception is going to apply. And it's important to think about uh, whether, you know, whether you have a reduction in your in your business activity for only a short period of time after the beginning of your forgiveness period, on the whole, when you look on average across your forgiveness period, can you demonstrate that the business activity was lower than prior to February 15? And this is to be point at which. You, we need to put a couple stars next to this exception because this is going to impact, I think, in a big way for any, any dealership that had a reduction in full-time equivalents and doesn't fall easily under one of the other exceptions to a reduction in the forgiveness amount. This is where you're going to need to do the analysis on whether the 24-week or the 8-week period is the better forgiveness period to use. And we're hearing from a lot of dealers that business is really starting to pick up and they're getting back to pre-COVID levels. So if you choose the 24-week period and your business is improving, when you average out your business activity over that 24-week period of time, you may not be able to show a reduction as compared to pre-COVID. But if you use a shorter eight-week period of time, on average, you may be able to show that you've had a reduction in business activity. So this is very, uh, this is a very important analysis that's going to need to occur only for businesses that had a reduction in their FTE count and don't fall under one of the other exceptions. And lastly, the last change that I want to talk about is the addition of the EZ application. The EZ application, if you all have not seen it, is much shorter and requires a lot less information to be provided. So this is going to be a big benefit to some dealers uh, when they apply for their forgiveness. But there are uh, two different options on the on the conditions that must exist in order to use the EV application. The first is that you've had no reduction in pay for any employee during the forgiveness period of more than 25%, period. Not whether you fall under one of the exceptions to the payroll test. You just can't have a reduction of more than 25% out of the payroll test for any employee during the forgiveness period. And that has to be combined with one of the two following conditions. Either 
there's been no reduction in the number of employees or average paid hours between January 1 and the end of the forgiveness period under the FTE test. But they do allow you to ignore reductions that result from the inability to rehire that same employee or someone of similar qualifications. And they also allow you to ignore a reduction in hours that was either sought by the employee or the employee refused an offer to restore those hours. Or, if that doesn't fit your situation, then if your business was not able to operate during the forgiveness period at the same level as before February 15th, then you can file an easy application. In both those scenarios, if you are utilizing the exceptions to the FDE test to fall under either number two or number three, you're going to need to document uh, your uh, qualify, the qualification under those exemptions. And we talked about what that would look like in some of the earlier slides. One of the things I didn't mention on the business activity is you're going to want to include with your application guidelines from the CDC, from OSHA, from your state government, and as applicable to your local government, where they are telling both employees and customers that they need to be cautious, that they need to um, avoid um, certain activities, uh, that uh, in some states, your sales, your sales operations uh, were not considered essential, at least for some period of time. Uh, and that, that certainly would support the fact that the business activity was reduced as a result of coronavirus-related guidelines. I think it's enough to show that uh, these guidelines caution people and some consumers and employees uh, from going out uh, in public spaces. Uh, and going out and shopping unless it's absolutely necessary. I think we heard that over and over again early on, that only do, only go to the places you absolutely have to go. And so that's going to impact dealerships where someone decides they can wait to have that vehicle service and or they can wait to purchase that new vehicle or that used vehicle. Okay. Uh, I've got some questions, David, up on the screen here that I'm going to read out and answer. Okay. Let me answer the first one. I can have one more, too. Anybody have any other questions? Rich, when will the um, forgiveness application... Hey, do you see any other questions? No, I don't have any other questions. I do have a question for you. When will the actual um, application to for forgiveness come out? I know some of the banks are just letting you do them online. Do you have any idea when those will come out or will be available? I don't know uh, exactly when they're going to come out or be available, but I know that they're under pressure to get that completed because you have some businesses that are, are certainly either at or approaching the end of their eight week forgiveness period. And if they choose the eight weeks instead of the 24 weeks, that business can begin making application immediately uh, upon the conclusion of the uh, eight week forgiveness period or. Uh, one, one of the clarifications in the rules that I didn't mention, because I don't think it happens often, but if a business uses up all of their loan proceeds on eligible payroll and non-payroll costs before the end of the forgiveness period, you can go ahead and apply for forgiveness at that time. And then if the lender has 60 days to um, make a, a recommendation on approving or not approving the forgiveness application at that point in time. So it's still going to take some time uh, to get all this done. So, so Rich, do, is it, or do you think the banks are expecting everyone to prepare 
the, a hard copy of the application that the SBA has sent out, or we have to go back through the portal um, from the original application. Yeah, I do. Uh, if, if, you, if, you, if your lender is not ready with your own, then I think you got to be prepared to, uh, to use the, the SBA uh, version of the application that, that, that we've seen. Now, it looks like we have had a couple of questions posted. Uh, any guidance about what transportation is under utilities? <laughs> That's a great question. And unfortunately, there's been no additional guidance on what was meant by that. Uh, so we really don't we don't know. But again, I think the good news is that if you're finding that during the eight-week period of time, you can't utilize all of your loan proceeds uh, without trying to uh, use some of the some of those proceeds for things that might fit into the definition of quote transportation or my earlier example of floor plan interest. I think the good news is that we don't have to worry about that as much now because we've got an extended forgiveness period you can choose uh, that surely by the end of the 24 weeks you will be able to use your loan proceeds on eligible payroll and non-payroll expenses that are clear in the, in the rules as they are. Okay. Um, when comparing wages to first quarter 2020, what are you comparing? Average weekly wages during the forgiveness period versus average weekly wages in first quarter, or is it something else? No, it is average weekly wages. Uh, thank you, uh, Terry Watson uh, complimented us, uh, thanking us for the information. This thing is very helpful. Uh, next question, has the IRS clarified its position on the deductibility of expenses paid with forgiveness PPP loan funds? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. That is a uh, that is probably a question best asked to your uh, dealer accountant. They've been more tuned in to what the IRS is doing. Uh, we've been more focused on what Congress and the SBA and the Department of Treasury are doing uh, with regard to these rules. Has the owner and employee been defined? Minority interest partner at a dealership. That is a question from Mary Lou. Uh, it is Mary Lou, and it's it's a um, I believe it's in I believe it's in one of the earlier interim rule changes, and I don't have that at my fingertips, but I'll have, be happy to. Uh, Try to locate that for you and, and shoot you an email. Uh, but that is that's a good question, and I believe it has been clarified. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Damon, did you have anything else? No, uh, thank you guys. Uh, we apologize for some of the technical difficulties, but um, uh, Rich, I we will be able to provide this deck and. Um, to our attendees, well, we can post that on our site sometime tomorrow. Um, and if you have any other questions for me to send to Rich, uh, please feel free to do so. Rich's uh, contact information is on your screen. And um, thank you guys, and thank you, Rich, as always. You guys have everyone have a happy Fourth of July weekend, and be safe. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.